John Dillinger. Pretty Boy Floyd. Baby Face Nelson. Al Capone. Bonnie and Clyde. The names evoke images of outlaw whiskey, bank holdups, and bloody shootouts. The guns they used were just as notorious. Colt 45s and 38s. The Tommy gun. Whippet guns. The Browning automatic rifle. These legendary weapons are forever linked with the storied lives of the gangsters of the 1920s and 30s. Their exploits filled the headlines, but it was their firepower that brought them fame. Gangsters employed pocket guns, which could be easily concealed. It's not a terribly effective caliber. Uh, 32 is more effective than 25 was. 25 is the most common pocket gun or pocket caliber, but uh, it beats throwing rocks. Gangsters were also the first to use automatic weapons outside of the military. Some of these guys came out firing, and this is what they came out firing. And it was scary to go against something like this. The desire to win at all costs set the gangsters of this era apart from any other criminal element in American history. They seem to be incredibly bold and daring and have great presence of mind in the face of fire with bullets whizzing by their head. They seemed entirely unaffected by that. So some of these jobs they pulled uh, might have been extraordinarily difficult, but they were there for the duration. But how and why did gangsters become so well-armed in the early part of the 20th century? The answer is simple, alcohol and greed. When the United States passed the Volstead Act in 1919, enacting prohibition, it was like an open invitation for criminals. Well, people continue to drink. Uh, overall, in the United States, drinking may have gone down very marginally, but this meant now bootleggers were supplying that liquor. People made enormous money in now the illicit traffic. So really, prohibition spawned this era. At the same time, in small towns across middle America, another brand of criminal was flourishing, the motorized bandit. Bonnie and Clyde, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Babyface Nelson derived their income not from booze, but from robbing banks. Though not as sophisticated as their big city counterparts, the motorized bandits became just as well known and just as deadly. If one understands that Bonnie Parker was four feet, 10 inches tall and weighed 85 pounds, and she could run and hip shoot a 20 pound machine rifle like a Marine, then you get a thoroughly different picture of who Bonnie Parker was and of what the Barra Gang was about. Today, the image of the 20s and 30s is often one of incredible violence and lawlessness. But in many respects, the era was one of the most crime-free periods in American history. There wasn't much crime against innocent citizens during the 1920s and 1930s. When the gangsters and outlaws killed people, they were from rival gangs or they were lawmen. In the late 1920s, uh, my mother told me my, that uh, with my father, they would walk through Central Park to after hours clubs up in Harlem with never a thought of danger. There, there was no such thing as mugging. There was no such thing as rape. That would outrage the community. The criminals of the day adopted a strict code of conduct regarding the protection of innocent civilians. 
And as the Roaring Twenties gave way to the despair of the Great Depression, many gangsters became romanticized figures. In particular, the public viewed the motorized bandits of the Midwest as latter-day Robin Hoods. To properly understand the gangster era of the 1920s and 30s, you first must know how America was. In that time, you have poverty beyond the ability of most people today to imagine. Racism was the law of the land, and firearms of any kind were available to anyone. There were a series of high-profile criminals who attracted the public's attention. Law enforcement in those days uh, could only go to, a lot of cases, city limits, county limits, and to state limits that stop. Well, then the guys could, could flee uh, in peace to the next state or the next county. Both big city gangsters and the motorized bandits borrowed their tactics from another romanticized age of American lawlessness, the Old West. Many of the criminals who got their start in the 1920s had grown up hearing stories about outlaws like Billy the Kid and Jesse James. Rumor has it that Clyde Barrow studied the tactics employed during the Civil War by infamous Confederate raider Bill Anderson. Barrow favored the same run-and-gun techniques that made Anderson's unit one of the most feared by Union soldiers. Prohibition and money gave the gangsters and bandits of the 1920s opportunity and motive. But it was World War I that gave them firepower. When the war ended, the United States was flooded with millions of weapons that returned home with soldiers from the front. Because the nation had almost no gun laws, it was possible for a private citizen to own even the most powerful military machine guns. Despite the efforts of gun manufacturers to keep their weapons out of the hands of criminals, it was easy for almost anyone to get a hold of serious firepower. Actually, you could buy them on the commercial market. Uh, Colt did make a commercial model, the R-75, and the Colt Monitor was available if, if somebody had enough money. Colt tried to regulate who the guns went to, but it was quite easy to have a front man. There were several gunsmiths in Chicago, uh, in the Illinois areas who would buy, who would purchase weapons for the underworld. The access to high-powered weapons, fueled by the potential to make millions of dollars, gave the outlaws of the era a unique and deadly characteristic, an aura of invincibility. But before big gangster guns blazed across America, Gangsters favored a small, easily concealed weapon to do their bidding. Their choice was the pocket gun. Even though the gangster era was ultimately defined by big, powerful automatic weapons, outlaws initially believed smaller was better. Pocket guns were compact and easy to conceal. They were also highly popular on both sides of the law. For many people, the pocket gun was the great equalizer that helped keep society in check. Pocket guns, to me, bring back a more civilized era. Uh, I, I very much believe in politeness and uh, being courteous to one another. And uh, you should do it of your own volition. But in the 20s and 30s, and it didn't matter if you were in Chicago or if you were in South Georgia or if you were somewhere in the Midwest or Arizona, you were polite to someone if for no other reason you didn't know what they had their hand on in their pocket. And so it would behoove you to be on your best behavior. Not insult a man's lady, don't kick his dog, leave his children alone because he just might reach in his pocket and put a bullet in you. Pocket guns didn't pack much of a wallop, but in the early days of organized crime, getting the drop on someone was more important than the size of your gun. The most favored pocket guns were either a 25 or 32 caliber, 
usually manufactured by Colt. The guns were easily concealed inside a pair of pleated pants or in a shoulder holster. Well, right now I'm loading the magazine for a Colt 1903 pocket pistol uh, in 32 caliber. And this was a very popular, very common caliber, very common pistol from about 1903 up until just recently here. I'm placed it into the magazine, uh, the hollow of the gun. A uh, gun just about like this was used by Bonnie Parker to break uh, Clyde out of jail in Waco. Uh, the story goes that she had one of these taped to her thigh when she busted Clyde out of the Waco jail. And, uh, and he went on another spree. Now, Bonnie Parker was a pretty small woman. I, they say she was about 4'11", I believe. And so I don't imagine she had much of a thigh. So you can that says something for the concealability of the gun. The problem with larger pistols, like a 45, was obvious. Even under a coat, everyone knew when a gangster was packing. But the downside with the pocket guns gave them limited life as criminals became more brazen. In fact, many gangsters of the 1920s came to consider pocket guns as their last chance weapons. Uh, this is the magazine for a Colt 25 1908 pocket automatic. The whole idea behind a 25 automatic is that it is the last resort. It's either this or a pocket knife before you're pretty much out of business. Uh, it holds six rounds. They were available in nickel plate or blue. Several variations on grips. You could get uh, hard rubber, bakelite, wood, pearl by custom order. It was good in a vest pocket. Uh, a lot of people would carry these on the end of a watch fob. So you wouldn't know what the other end of the pocket watch was. These were very popular with everyone. But as gangs grew more violent, police fought back and criminals quickly realized they needed to increase their firepower. Rifles and shotguns were at first seen as too cumbersome. Instead, gangsters of the day wanted a gun with a lot of stopping power that could still fit in the palm of their hand. The answer, two automatic pistols, the 45 and the Super 38. Both were large handguns. Both could kill a man where he stood. It's said that a gangster named Leslie Homer gave the Super 38 its greatest endorsement while being interrogated by police in Racine, Wisconsin. Racine Police Department had lost one of its members to the John Dillinger gang. And any time that they encountered a member of that gang, they gave him their undivided attention, as good cops will. And late in 1933, they sacked up Leslie Homer, who was a runner for the Dillinger gang, took him downtown and sweated him. And the words from Homer spilled out into newspapers and police stations all over the country. And one of the things he said was that if you want to give your coppers an even break, you need to get them one of those new Super 38 guns. A gun of that type will blow a hole in any bulletproof vest made. But even high-powered handguns required accuracy. In the run-and-gun style of the gangsters, there was little time to take aim. Pistols work best in close-fire situations. For robbing banks or shooting at an enemy from a moving car, something better was needed. Clyde Barrel, for one, didn't want to wait for the firearms industry to solve the problem. He did it himself. Clyde was known to be an expert with shotguns. He believed if he could combine the power of a shotgun with a smaller weapon that was easier to wield, he'd have the perfect gun. He found the solution by studying history. A century earlier, a Mormon by the name of Oren Porter Rockwell had developed a gun to protect his brethren in Utah. Rockwell cut the end of the stock and the barrel off a shotgun to give the weapon greater scatter effect. Clyde was convinced the same technique would work with the more powerful shotguns of the 1920s and 30s. 
he started sawing the ends off of Remington shotguns. He called his creation a whippet gun, supposedly because he could whip it out in an instant. This gun is a replica of a weapon that Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker used back in the 1930s. This gun was modified by having the barrel cut off to about a shotgun shell's length past the end of the magazine tube where the extra shells were held. If you'll notice that the design of the strap, it loops over the shoulder, but it's, what happens is if you hung it, you'd bring it up and it would swing it up to the shoulder. Now, it wasn't meant to be used like you see in the movies, like, like this, like you, like you see in all the action pictures nowadays. These are designed primarily to be shoulder fire weapons by people who, at the, who were actually using it who were of very small stature. As the gangster era progressed, one thing that set the outlaws apart was how good they were with their guns. Not only did they know their weapons and experiment with significant modifications to them, but they were some of the best marksmen of the age. They went out into the woods, they went into rural areas, they, they practiced, they knew their weapons, they cleaned their weapons, they broke them down because they knew you lived and died with your weapons. So they just didn't spray uh, bullets all over the area. And many of these uh, gunmen, the enforcers for these gangs were deadly marksmen and they practiced regularly. But as the gangs acquired bigger and better guns, so did law enforcement. By the mid-1920s, it became obvious to the more ruthless gangsters that in order to stay one step ahead of both the police and the competition, drastic steps needed to be taken. Being a good shot was no longer enough. Messages of intimidation would now be delivered in a hail of lead. The machine gun was about to become the gangster's weapon of choice. If there was one gun that let everyone know a criminal had arrived, it was the Tommy gun. Made famous by the gangster movies of Hollywood, the Tommy gun was the perfect criminal weapon. It was small, it had style, and it threw a lot of lead. This is a Colt Thompson 1921A. Has a fire rate of about 900 rounds a minute. Uh, it was very popular in the 20s and 30s with both sides of the law uh, due to the fact that it shot the 45 Colt cartridge, which is well known for its man-stopping ability. And it delivered a lot of lead in a hurry. The Tommy gun has been forever linked to Al Capone and his bootlegging activities in Chicago. Ironically, Capone himself only fired a Tommy gun once. He had his henchmen do the dirty work. The most notorious use of the weapon was the 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where Capone went after a rival gang. Out the window of a car or in a close quarters, uh, these are, are, are literally a bullet hose. You can just take this gun and just hose the room down in a matter of seconds and uh, very little that gets hit with it gets back up. Though the public immediately associated the Tommy gun with outlaws, many of the most famous gangsters never used it. John Dillinger had his picture taken holding a Thompson, but he was a very bad shot. Bonnie and Clyde, perhaps the most famous gangsters associated with big guns, never owned a Tommy gun. For the barrel gang, the Tommy gun wasn't powerful enough. Though the Thompson could spit out 45 caliber slugs at 600 rounds a minute and kill a man in an instant, it couldn't always penetrate car bodies. At the time, there was only one handheld gun that guaranteed the power to splinter a V8 Ford, the Browning Automatic Rifle, otherwise known as the BAR. It's a very powerful firearm. 
It's more powerful than the Thompson, but it was probably the most powerful portable firearm that was available to the gangsters. This gun here is an exact replica of uh, Clyde Bauer's personal 1918 Browning automatic rifle. He named the scatter gun. Uh, it was captured from the gang in uh, Dexter, Iowa. And basically, it's, it's a standard 1918 BAR that three or four inches of the barrel has been removed, and the stock has been cut off just past the buffer tube. Uh, Clyde basically cut these guns down to make them more portable and makes a, a great gun for a motorized bandit. Clyde trained Bonnie in the use of firearms, and she became a very good marksman herself, not only using smaller caliber weapons, but she also used the BAR. And the BAR is a heavy automatic rifle that fires a 30 6 round. Bonnie didn't weigh much more than 100 pounds, uh, and yet she wielded one of the uh, nastiest uh, weapons ever used, the BAR. The BAR had been introduced by the Army at the end of World War I. When a gangster who knew how to handle one fired a BAR, all hell broke loose. It was a rock that got a lot of gangsters out of ambush situations. It gave them the firepower and the ability to, to break out of almost insurmountable odds. If you just want to throw up a lot of lead to, to cover your escape, it's, it's great because uh, the human factor, if you're firing so at someone, they're generally going to duck unless they've, they've been through combat. And especially with something like this, it, it has a, a booming report and you're throwing a lot of light out. It, it makes people duck. One of the most famous shootouts with the BAR involved Bonnie and Clyde. In 1933, they were trapped in an apartment building in Joplin, Missouri. Police had surrounded the building. The barrel gang opened up from the second floor of a two-story stone apartment with three BARs. As the guns rattled on, Bonnie yelled downstairs, turn it on them, Clyde, we're coming down. The barrel gang came down the stairs with Bonnie lugging a BAR. She turned on a large oak tree behind which was Sergeant G.B. Kaler of the Missouri Highway Patrol. The splinters forced him backward over a stump and he fell down with only one bullet in his gun. He would later say after they had escaped that that little red-headed woman filled my face up with splinters with one of those damn guns. One gangster who lived by his BAR and eventually died by it was Slim Gray. Though Gray was not as well known as some of his more infamous colleagues, he had an air of invincibility about him. Slim was a minor league crook who was hiding out in Chicago when police and the FBI showed up outside his door. Gray fervently believed that his BAR and bulletproof vest would protect him. He was very wrong. Slim Gray, all six feet two and 125 pounds of him, came down the back stairs with a bulletproof vest and, and lugging a BAR. At the bottom of the stairs, a gunfight broke out. The agent with the 351 rifle shot Slim Gray straight through the vest, and he flopped down in the yard. They took him to the hospital where he died, and they dug out the bullet, which went through the bulletproof vest's front panel and flattened against the back panel. It is occasionally displayed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation as one of its grisliest gangster souvenirs. Big automatic weapons were quickly becoming the order of the day. Pretty Boy Floyd loved machine guns. So, of course, did Machine Gun Kelly. But perhaps the best shot with a machine gun during the gangster era was a lesser known criminal named Vern Miller. Like many of the gangsters of the 1920s, Miller was trained by the army during World War I. After the war, he returned home to South Dakota, where he became a policeman and then a sheriff. But when Miller was caught in Besley, he fled and began a life of crime. His training as a police officer made him an excellent mule man. 
gangsters like Alvin Karpis and Pretty Boy Floyd hired Miller for his ability to drive fast and safe. But it was his military background that brought him fame. Vern Miller was reportedly so good with a machine gun, any machine gun, that he could write his name in bullets. Miller pushed his luck when he crossed Al Capone, and Capone went looking for him. Capone sent three of his flat nose boys to a place called Fox River. They mixed it up with Miller. When the cops got to the scene, they called it the Fox River Massacre, assuming that these first class hitters of Capone's had been wiped out by an army. They had, in fact, been wiped out by an army of one, Burn Miller. But Miller's luck soon ran out. When he crossed Detroit's notorious Purple Gang, he paid the price. A couple of hitters from the Purple Gang in Detroit who died in a similar fashion to Capone's boys in Fox River. Sometime thereafter, someone left Burn Miller's bullet riddled body as a Detroit roadside decoration. The Purple Gang had no comment. As the bodies piled up, law enforcement began to understand that gangsters had better guns and were willing to use them at any cost. To win the battle against crime, the police would have to do the same. By the early 1930s, the gangsters of the big cities and the bandits of the Midwest were legends. The public loved their Robin Hood image and relished every story of shootouts and holdups. Police and federal agents had a much different view. The outlaws they faced were some of the best armed criminals in history and some of the most ruthless. One of the most deadly gangsters of the day was Lester Gillis, otherwise known as Babyface Nelson. Nelson prided himself on his use of firearms and his willingness to kill members of law enforcement. In fact, when it came to the police, Nelson never ran, even on the occasions when he himself was shot. He would always turn and fight sometimes to the dismay of his partners in crime. On August 14, 1934, Nelson, his wife, and another outlaw were driving near Barrington, Illinois. When the men spotted two cars of federal agents headed in the opposite direction, the chase was on, with Nelson in hot pursuit. A rolling gun battle ensued. One must understand that Nelson had a particular hatred for federal agents. He carried pictures, tag numbers, and descriptions of them in his car and actively hunted them. The cars eventually wound up ditched on the side of the road, but the guns were still roaring. And it was just a hellish firefight with uh, uh, hundreds of rounds uh, being sprayed all over the area, pinning down Babyface Nelson. And he told his uh, partner, he said, he said, I've had enough of this. And he charged the FBI agents, guns a-blazing. It was Babyface Nelson's last hurrah. Not even his trusted Tommy gun could save him from the blaze of bullets fired by the doomed FBI agents. Nelson tried to drive away, but he had 17 holes in him. They took him to Father Philip Coghlan's house in Chicago. They took him to another safe house where he was given the last rites, and they wrapped the dying gangster in the blanket that he had been clothed in, and when he died, they laid him out on a tombstone in Nile Center. If Babyface Nelson was the most deadly individual of the gangster era, the most deadly gang by far 
was the outfit run by Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker. The Barrow gang carried the biggest, baddest guns. In addition to Clyde's homemade whippet guns, the BAR was a favorite. The Barrows were ruthless, especially toward law enforcement. Their main motivation was making money as easily as possible and not getting caught. If someone got hurt along the way, that was just the price of doing business. Like many of the criminals of the time, Bonnie and Clyde were seemingly unafraid of death, partly because of the intense firepower they carried. They had shot their way out of so many tight spots and killed so many law enforcement officers that they were greatly feared by the police. A lawman named Frank Hammer had assembled a posse of six men to hunt down Bonnie and Clyde. On the morning of May 23, 1934, outside Gibson, Louisiana, Bonnie and Clyde approached a gangster mailbox. Hammer and his men were waiting with an arsenal that would have made the Barrel Gang proud. It stood up on the hill, two BARs, a Remington 8 police rifle in 35 caliber, three Remington guns in 30. Clyde Barrow pulled up to the mailbox, took his foot off the clutch, and never heard the hammer fall. It is not by treachery that these men ambushed him this way. And it is not because Clyde was so bad. It was because Clyde Barrow was that good. And had they given him any chance, someone might not have gone home to his wife. Clyde, struck by 48 rounds, died immediately. Bonnie was hit 37 times. Police cautiously approached the car. When they opened the passenger door, Bonnie fell into the arms of Officer Ted Hinton. She had a slight pulse, but by the time Hinton tumbled her back into the car, she was dead. The death of Bonnie and Clyde was the beginning of the end of the gangster era. Many of the most famous gangsters and outlaws of the time would die in similar ways. The powerful guns they had helped make famous were now turned against them by the forces of law and order. In the world of gangster guns, the philosophy of an eye for an eye had become a bitter reality. By the mid-1930s, the age of gangsters and their guns was on the way out. In 1933, the Volstead Act was repealed and legalized liquor again pumped through the veins of the United States. That meant now there was not great gobs of money to be made in illicit trafficking of uh, alcohol. And this was really the beginning of the end for the great gangs. This was their... Uh, money cow, their cash cow, that drove the operation. That was ended. In the big cities, reform-minded mayors and city councils were voted into office. Without the large amount of cash the gangs used to have to throw around, it became nearly impossible to bribe public officials. The 1934 National Firearms Act was an attempt by lawmakers to make it tougher for criminals to access guns. During the early days of the reign of terror, gangsters had been careful not to kill civilians. But as their guns became more powerful and their desperation more severe, errant shots began hitting the wrong people. An increasingly angry public grew weary of innocent bystanders, especially children, falling victim to the guns of hoodlums. In addition, police communications had greatly improved. No longer was an outlaw free and clear if he could lose a chasing police car. 
Police headquarters may own calling all cars. We'll proceed immediately, okay? Now, every police car was equipped with two-way radios. Catching escaping bandits became much easier. On top of it all, the times had, quite simply, changed. The rumblings of war coming from Europe swallowed the innocence of the previous age, especially in small town America. The dislocation of the rural folk had occurred by then. They had moved to the cities, they had moved to California by the hundreds of thousands. Um, that era was, was over. Society had changed, and no longer did you have the right social milieu for social banditry, kind of the Robin Hoods of the Southwest. A less tolerant public, stronger law enforcement, and better tactics and equipment with which to catch the crooks made the life of a gangster all but impossible. Even their arsenals of powerful guns, which they had relied on for nearly 20 years to do their bidding, were ineffective against the tides of change. Perhaps the event that best defined the end of the gangster age was the death of pretty boy Floyd. In November 1934, a woman named Ellen Conkle heard a knock at the door of her Ohio farmhouse. It was morning and a handsome stranger was there asking for something to eat. Conkle had given food to strangers before, so she invited the men inside. For the next half hour, he ate without saying much. When he finished, he declared the meal was fit for a king. The man gave Ellen Conkle a dollar for the breakfast, about four times what it was worth. A moment later, Conkle's yard filled up with police cars, and the stranger took off running across her cornfield. They saw him emerging from this farmhouse, and he made a dash across the field. And uh, they simply executed him. Uh, half dozen uh, rifles uh, opened up on him. And in fact, uh, when they came upon him in this field, uh, there's some fairly strong evidence that he was still alive, and they shot him there at point-blank range. They weren't concerned with courts in those days. And when they, when they found somebody and that guy uh, raised a finger to resist or a gun, they just shot him, and, and it was the end of it. The police told Ellen Conkle that the fellow she had just given breakfast to was none other than pretty boy Floyd. The man who had hunted down Floyd was Melvin Purvis, the head of the FBI Chicago office. The story of gangsters and their guns can be summed up in the moment Purvis stood next to the body of pretty boy Floyd in that Ohio field. Pretty Boy Floyd on his person has two 45 automatics. One is made in 1918, one is about a year and a half younger. Melvin Purvis on his person has a 1925 Colt commercial automatic, nickel plated. And at the end of the day, what you must know is both men chose not similar guns, but exactly the same gun. And they chose them for the same reason. And what separated these two men was not their guns, but their choice in life and their character. Since the end of the gangster era, there have been few individuals in the modern age who have used guns like the outlaws of old. Experts believe that the nature of crime has changed. Where gangsters of old fought battles against large institutions like police and banks, today's criminals are less willing to take on the world. Instead, Crimes against people and property are more common than during the daring days of the gangster age. Another reason the age died in the days before World War II was the spirit that made the criminals stand out was extinguished. 
few outlaws of the modern age exhibit the kind of willingness to die that many of the gangsters of the 1920s and 30s lived with every day. Because their exploits were so outrageous, and because of their willingness to use the best guns of their time, they continue to fascinate. Today, weapons used by the gangsters and motorized bandits are highly prized by collectors. Transferable Browning automatic rifles for the general public, they've almost doubled in price in the last year. Even what we call dealer samples that are available to dealers only, class three dealers, have gone up to the, uh, the realm of $3,500. It's a testament to the staying power of the image gangsters portray. They use the state of the art weaponry. So here they were fighting lawmen with BARs, Thompson submachine guns, uh, high-powered hunting rifles, handguns of all sorts, uh, plus a number of weapons that they modified themselves. They didn't attack, for the most part, the average citizen. Most of their great gun battles were with lawmen, and many times they came out on the winning side of that gun batter battle. Uh, they had magnificent escapes with all odds stacked against them. And so I think Americans in general tend to romanticize figures such as that who take on the establishment with nothing but their own guile, their own courage, their own nerve, their own savvy and intelligence. But in the end, the outlaws of the 20s and 30s were beaten at their own game. Police got smarter, the public became intolerant, and the guns on which the criminals relied were just as powerful and just as effective in the hands of an FBI agent. Within a few short years, the bloody legacy of gangsters and their guns was brought to an end. Those who chose to live by their guns had died by them just as violently. Thank you.